today, Professor Charlie Beckett from the Media and Communications Department is going to talk to us about British politics, the changing role of the media, uh, building on what he said last week. Charlie. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, got loads I'm going to try and get through, and in contrast to uh, last week, for those of you who were here, I'm hoping this this week we might get a few laughs out of this as well, so um, show some silly video, but uh, that will take up time, so I'm going to sort of keep up the pace, but feel free to interject if you think I'm uh, not explaining myself or you want to, to raise something while, we're, while I'm in mid-flow. Um, as Tony says, this is a lovely chance to, to do things in two parts. And in this, uh, the first lecture last week, I tried to explain um, that, in my view, journalism you know, had traditionally has had a role as the so-called fourth estate in relationship to mainstream politics. I hope, so. I hope I showed that journalism has a particular set of functions uh, in the democratic context of informing, deliberation and accountability. I think I m argued that journalism has many flaws, much like politics, but the, 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 it is the same things that people criticise in journalism that actually are its strength in a liberal democracy. I ended up by suggesting that the real problem for journalism, especially mainstream journalism, um, and incidentally politics in Western democracies, is not necessarily the inherent failings of these trades, but their overall uh, increasing irrelevance to citizens. In other words, they're not losing um, only authority, but they're losing attention. Uh, and I showed that, I hope, that journalism and its relation to politics has changed over the centuries, and more recently for technological, social and economic reasons. But what I'm going to look at today is that arguably journalism has never changed more than it has done in the last uh, decade or 20 years. And what I want to set out today is some thoughts about how those changes might create a different kind of political journalism and ask what impact that might have upon democracy itself. And I should say right at the beginning, of course, that um, there is not going to be a final answer because we're very much in the middle of this process. Uh, the pace of change in news media is rapid. If you think about something like Facebook, um, which you know, allegedly helped spark revolutions in the Arab world, it's still only just celebrated its 10th anniversary. And by its nature, by its very nature, media change self-represents itself in ways that are often unrepresentative of real or deeper changes. In other words, journalism talking about journalism, sorry, journalists talking about journalism aren't always the most objective of guides. Um, much of the evaluation of media change is, of course, actually conditioned by people's social, economic or political perspectives. It's relative, it's subjective, and it's very dynamic, uh, very much, I think, like politics. But in this lecture, I will try and show um, how political journalism is becoming networked, how that is redefining what we mean by political journalism or news. Um, then we're going to look at some of the sort of problematics around this, the so-called filter bubble, the distraction problem, and then try and tackle some of the big questions about um, is, are these changes making a mediation around politics somehow more democratic? Uh, is it making politics itself or society more democratic? And then ending up with trying to address some of the challenges that this poses to journalism, brackets, and politics. And then just finally ending with some thoughts about how one might regain uh, engagement with the citizen uh, in these networks. Um, the debate is often seen in very binary terms. When I started at the LSE eight years ago, it'd be things like, are bloggers journalists or not? Is the internet good or is the internet bad? Um, and of course, um, you know, the internet, for example, is not either re revolutionary or reactionary. It's not just either making us stupid or super intelligent. Of course, the answer is that it's much more complex. However, I'm going to resort to a binary, <laughs> um, at least to describe, if you like, the, the mini history of, of, of this debate. Um, 
that very much the view upon, especially around the politics, democracy, and the internet, or politics, democracy, and journalism, very much divided into a kind of uh, pessimistic and a, a kind of optimistic camps, if you like. Um, so, for example, if you take this stunning piece of idealism, um, you can read it <coughs> yourselves, but it's, it goes, the joining of these two forces, the information revolution and the human urge to cooperate for justice, makes possible for the first time in history something we have only dreamt about, the creation of a truly global society, a global society where people anywhere and everywhere can discover their shared values. At this point, you sort of want violins to kick in, or even better, that kind of lovely pumping, mm. um, building um, rock music. Um, a, a, everywhere you can sh discover their shared values, communicate with each other, and do not need to meet or live next door to each other to join together with people in other countries in a single moral universe to bring about change. So quite an extraordinary, uh, exceptional claim. Does anybody know who made that claim? If you've seen the slides that I put up, you'll, you'll know. Does anybody know who made that claim? No, it wasn't him. It was actually, it should be, shouldn't it? But it wasn't him. He's much, much more cynical. Obama is much more cynical about media. It was actually this guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. Um, and the point about it is, obviously, that, um, you know, Gordon um, is somebody who... Whatever you think about his politics, and I think he's a you know, deeply ethical politician who you know, wanted to change the world for the better. But he was also one of the most cynical, media-obsessed political operators we've ever seen in Downing Street. He's a man who hired Damien McBride, then tolerated Damien McBride, who was his, one of his press people. And if you read Damien's book, Power Trip, which is a catalogue of how ethics, free spin, became absolutely routine. Uh, in Downing Street. So he also, the, the man who made um, possibly one of the most ridiculous ever YouTube videos in existence. I'll just play you a, a minute of excruciation. This is Gordon Brown's response to the expenses scam. Around the country, I've been struck by the comments that are made about young people when I meet them, about what jobs they want to do when they grow up. And you know, I meet large numbers of people who want to be doctors and nurses, many who want to be teachers and firemen and ambulance men, many who want to be in the caring services. And when I ask them why they want to do what they plan to do, they say they want to make a difference. But these days, I rarely meet anyone who wants to be a member of Parliament when they grow up. <laughs> now, there isn't, the original isn't available anymore for understandable reasons, so this is the only version that's there with which is these clips. And, you know, it, it, it's, this was the moment when, you know, people's faith in politicians was at an all-time low. And he had a bright idea, one of his staff did, to take to YouTube and do this kind of video. We're going to see a similar one later. Now, you can be sort of subtle about this. You can say, how clunky. There he is doing it as a party political broadcast. You know, and then there's the horrible grimacing, but that's, you know, an unfortunate, perhaps, reflex and so on. But it's, it's fundamentally about him preaching. Now, you've actually listened to the text, which none of you have done. If you go and read the text, it's actually quite a moving peroration about how politicians have failed the younger generation. It's quite a subtle and um, uh, you know, convincing argument, which is destroyed by his failure to understand that this is not a medium where you get up and start uh, lecturing people uh, and where you can be held, uh, made to look so, so, so ridiculous. Um, and I think you know, that's such a discrepancy with what we've you know, with his aspirations for new media. You know, he failed to understand it. So it's not surprising that, you know, other politicians also became disillusioned with the, what we call in the media department, the affordances of the internet, the possibilities that you have with digital media. And this was from Tony Blair's um, so-called feral beast speech in 2007, which again, um, you know, as a journalist, 95% uh, of it is, is, is a brilliant description of what should be good political journalism. Um, but apart from the bit where he just didn't like journalists when they bit him on the bum, as it were, um, he also expressed this, um, you know, disillusion with new media. Bear in mind, of course, this was the, the Prime Minister who didn't, famously could not use or did not use a PC while he was in Downing Street. 
Um, but again, he talks about how these new forms are even more pernicious. They're less balanced, more intent on the latest conspiracy theory multiplied by five. So there you have um, the pessimistic um, side as well, if you like. So, um, you know, as he said, let's try and move away from the simplistic binaries. But that is the fundamental um, challenge. Now, this is, of course, uh, intellectually when we're thinking judgmentally about the internet. And, of course, this was how, when I was a lad, this was how political news happened. Um, you know, the, the foregrounding of the, the fact that Kenneth Kendall there is, is in a newsroom, as if he's just turned from his desk from finding out stuff and he's going to tell you. Same with the New York Times. Look how uncompromisingly badly designed the New York Times was. Um, but actually, do you know what? It hasn't changed, um, hasn't changed that much. Um, the bulk of media, while we're thinking about the internet, is still like this. Most people get most of their information from television. Newspapers are still extraordinarily powerful, as we suggested in the last lecture. It's not one or the other, of course. Both are, both are uh, digital as well. Um, but this is what has changed everything. Not just this particular story, but the fact of this story. I don't know how many people are familiar with this. Has everyone, has everyone seen this image? It's not the most famous image, but I particularly like it. It's um, from about three or four years ago now, when this plane crashed into the Hudson, Bay, Hudson River, rather, and the you know, extraordinary acts of skill and courage by the pilot not to crash into any of the buildings in New York, and these people are saved. The first report of this, the first image we have of this incident, this event, the first time the world knew about it, was when a guy is on his way to work, um, uh, I think he's walking, and he takes a picture of this on his smartphone and instantly uploads it to Twitter. And that's the first bit. And you can tell, you know, it's not very good quality. You can tell, um, and I think he says something like, wow, or something. But, and that is instantly when that story becomes known to the world. And in a city with tens of thousands, probably, of journalists and cameramen and photographers, it was this guy who was a commuter walking past this fantastic story um, who first told the world. And that is the point of digital, internet-based journalism. Now, you could call that citizen journalism, but it's more a kind of accidental uh, journalism. He would never have described himself as a journalist. He was a citizen who happened to be on his work and see something. And that changes everything. It was instantaneous. It was incredibly cheap. It was universal in the sense that it could reach anywhere, potentially. It was ubiquitous, again, in the sense that it could have been a citizen anywhere that could have done that. Um, it's on demand. It's all the time. It's by anyone. And so we are all, in that sense, at least potentially journalists. And we are all also, interestingly, all, in a way, working now for media organisations. I mean, most obviously in, 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 at the LSE, where you know, we're publishers, there are podcasts, people are filming this kind of thing. You all are, not you are all, but most of you are on social media. You're all part of these, um, if you like, journalistic media information networks. In that sense, as, as Professor Silverstone, the late Professor Silverstone said in his book, Media and Morality, media is environmental. And he meant that both in the scientific sense, that it's everywhere, a bit like air or water, but it's also environmental in the sense that the same way you can have polluted air or polluted water and you can manage those resources, the same thing applies uh, to the idea of media. So. What kind of media do you get? Well, um, how does it change? Well, just a few examples. Um, here's one. I don't know how many of you are sort of addicted to Mumsnet. Um, this is the biggest uh, parenting website. It's one of the biggest um, popular forums in Britain, full stop, actually. And not surprisingly, it's aimed at women uh, with children. Um, and the interesting thing in this context, yeah, uh, this is a wonderful forum called... It's the one about to be incensed by gnaw stockpots that just taken my eye. Really yeah, and that's the mix, which is, yeah, this is called Am I Being Unreasonable, this, this thread or this strand. It, and it's, in other words, am I being unreasonable 
to think that Tony Travers is actually a charlatan and, and knows very little about local authorities. You know, obviously that is unreasonable. But also, as um, as Tony has astutely pointed out, some of this would be um, the BBC. Isn't it time we just got shot of it? Well, that's a sort of that could be a newsnight lead story, couldn't it? On the other hand. Um, to be incensed by Norse stockpots is probably not going to be the lead item on the Times this morning. Um, but if you look at this, much of this is a very political forum. I don't mean just particularly this particular bit of it. But in that sense that, especially when you redefine politics in a broader sense, like education. Um, so there was, um, I don't know if it's on this one. Well, you've got one here, actually. Who really gets £500 plus weekly state benefits? So that's people talking from their own experience about what is a very contentious issue around uh, welfare benefits. They're not talking about it in terms of parliamentary debates or legislation. Um, they're talking about it in a much more socially based way. And so this has become a really important site for political deliberation. Politicians beg to be allowed to be interviewed on this website so they can reach that crucial demographic of younger uh, women with children. Vital, as you know, marginal uh, polling group, um, but very hard to engage. And this website, in many different ways, has got them to engage. And it's, it's actually run by a couple of professional journalists, but literally only a couple of professional journalists, creating a huge volume of people reporting upon their lives, deliberating about politics in a way that's very, I would argue, very uh, influential. Uh, and so again, another classic kind of new political journalism that could not exist without digital, without the internet. And that is definably different. And if you go and look at the stuff we've written about this, you know, the, it, it's quite clear that this creates a different kind of discourse, especially interesting for those of you interested in gender. Um, that, that, that women talk quite differently when they're on this website than they might do on another website about politics. Um, but it's not just about stuff that is non-professional, outside the mainstream. Um, most of my work looks at um, how mainstream uh, journalism has changed. And this is just one little example. It's a nice one because Andrew Sparrow is the Guardian's, one of the Guardian's poll calls. He actually wrote a history of parliamentary reporting He's a very traditional journalist. He goes and listens to parliamentary debates and writes them up. And his life was transformed when he started doing what we call live blogs. And we're publishing a report on live blogs in a month's time, the way that they transform the way that stories are told. And basically, they're a kind of stream, like a diary or a blog that's constantly updated. And it mixes in lots and lots of different sources. This is a quote he's taken from... So this one was in response to... Um, was there a parliamentary debate on? Can't it's remember. Like Lord Ascot's polling. Yes, yeah, so, so, it's, so it's to do with this reaction to uh, an opinion poll from uh, Lord Ashcroft. But it mixes. There's a blogger. Um, there's a journalist. He's quoting a journalist. He's quoting another journalist off Twitter. And at the bottom would have been comments for readers to contribute as well. So again, put very simply, instead of that idea of Andrew writing a piece about politics, publishing it in the Guardian, and you all reading it. Here's a live stream of information drawn from many different resource, uh, sources. It's interactive. Um, it's, it's utterly connected to other platforms as well, which again goes completely against the grain for journalists. And so you end up at the end of the proverbial day with a record, a very different kind of record of that event or that debate, um, but also one that while it's happening uh, offers you a different way of connecting into um, the politics that it's talking about. And that's what I call networked journalism. It, instead of linear journalism, you've got um, journalism that is uh, a hybrid. It's a blend of, if you like, traditional legacy media. Um, then you've got more social news media like BuzzFeed and Reddit. Reddit, for example, which is entirely created by its users. Uh, and social networks. Uh, platforms like Pinterest, I don't know if you know about Pinterest, where people create kind of pin boards of lovely pictures they've seen on the internet, which again created entirely by uh, the citizen. 90% um, of it is about cupcakes and embroidery. Um, but interestingly, one of the biggest sharers of Guardian news stories is Pinterest. 
again, very important demographic of, of women uh, with Pinterest. So you've got this structural change, this mixed media, but all of them uh, networked and part of that same environment that I talked about that, that Mumsnet inhabits, that Guido Fawkes inhabits. And so what's happened is that this is how, in a sense, you know, when I talked last week about the idea of the fourth estate, um, you know, this is, this is, um, this was, sorry, when I first did this, when I first joined the LSE and I saw all these media studies graphics which tried to show you how politics and media interacted. They looked like the sort of inside of a, uh, of a microchip or, you know, very complicated boiler diagram. And for me, it was just reduced to this. Politicians did politics, and journalists told the public what was going on. And now it's changed into this rather crude graphics, which makes no physical sense. You can't have... Yeah, anyway. Um, but the point is, it, is that, of course, that the media is now disintermediated, the word I used last week, which is that the politicians and citizens can theoretically interact without any help from Andrew Sparrow or anybody else. So that raises obviously the question about, you know, why do we need this media or journalism? What is its role in political reporting um, now that we can all be uh, networked directly? Um, and that's a big challenge um, for journalists and over the last 10, 20 years, they've been basically in a state of shock, kind of the, what are the stages of mourning? There's kind of initial shock, then a dawning realisation that their lives are changing, and then a process, you hope, of, of, of adaption. And one of the things they've had to adapt to is to this redefinition of the idea of what a journalist is. So instead of somebody who produces political journalism that you consume in the same way that a, a, a car worker builds a car and you buy it, uh, they're now in a new relationship in these networks. It may be they're a curator. The people who run Mumsnet don't tell the people what to write or talk about. They curate uh, the forums for other people. Uh, they may be that there's a kind of partnership that you're working. Um, it may be that you're a social networker. You're a journalist who happens to be on Twitter, retweeting other people, uh, interacting with other people on that platform. Or it may be that you have... Um, you know, a very specialist role. Uh, in that sense, Andrew Sparrow is both a curator, but he's also a specialist. He knows a huge amount about uh, parliamentary politics and therefore is a very good um, network journalist it, uh, on that topic. But the whole idea of what it is to be a political journalist has been challenged. Likewise, you know, the idea of what you mean by news. A plane crashes into the Hudson River is a sort of about as classic a definition as, as you can get, uh, both in the sort of it's surprising thing, but also something has really happened. And it's a sort of cautionary thing that, especially in politics, uh, political journalism, go and look at your newspapers or your websites. 90% of news, nothing has actually happened. It's somebody's commented on something or somebody's written another story about something that had happened or something is continuing. But especially in a networked environment, that whole idea, if you can know instantly when that plane has hit the Hudson, then what's the point of all the other journalism that's going to happen about that incident? It suddenly becomes, because it's so much easier to know those facts so quickly, uh, increasingly there's a tendency to, uh, it, to move into analysis, reaction, um, emotional response and so on much more quickly, perhaps giving you more detail, giving you more context. Um, to, to that first primary event. And so you'll see, and I won't go into this too much, but you'll see that journalism becomes much more of a kind of uh, liquid reality. And instead of being about um, journalists handing out uh, authoritative final versions of reality, it's much more about a relationship. It's about saying, uh, this has happened or somebody has said that, we are now going to tell you instantly and now we're going to find out together almost uh, what it really means. Uh, at its most crude, this is the kind of Sky News cliche of being never wrong for long. You know, we have just heard, we are getting reports of, and now let's see together, because you are immediately checking your other sources, so the journalist is in a sense 
um, in a relationship that's more equal with you. And that means that when the journalist does pronounce, like Andrew Sparrow when he's writing his live blogs, he's much more contested. Literally, you're able to go onto that page and say, you know, I think you're getting this wrong, I've seen some other sources, uh, there are other points of view. So those are the kind of things you have to think about, um, you know, what difference this makes. As I'm trying to edge now towards um, this idea of, you know, so what? Your, your lovely journalism is changing, Charlie, but what impact might this have in terms of its role uh, in reporting politics? And there are lots of different, I'm not going to go into all these, you'll be relieved to hear, um, but there are lots of um, problematics. I mean, the third one, verification, is the one that all, people always bring up. With all this network stuff, how do we know that it's true? When in fact it's probably one of the lesser problems that we have. You get lots of photos on Twitter which are, which are, are fake. You know, uh, people say, this is, this is um, too good to be, to be true. Well, it usually is not true uh, if it's so extraordinary. But generally speaking, um, verification isn't a huge problem. That's partly because it's a self-correcting mechanism. But I want to take, I want to look at a couple of, uh, of the problematics to uh, try and explore what difference it's made. Um, and without sort of trying to give everything away, I think, again, um, I'm afraid the conclusions, let alone research-based conclusions, are going to be harder to establish. What, what is um, clear in its lack of clarity is that we're moving into a period of much greater complexity and instability or uncertainty around what media effects there are. Um, if you think about one, the idea of the filter bubble, um, which is the idea that because you can choose your media, your news media, the sources and the platforms that you use, that you are surely going to filter out the stuff that challenges you or upsets you or criticises you, and you're going to go with the familiar, um, the known, knowns, the stuff that you approve of. Um, it's actually quite difficult to, to work out if that is happening, but there's more to it than even just that, actually, that because you've got much greater choice, it actually affects um, the way that you make selections and the way that you might influence other people. So this is a, a graph which shows uh, how basically how people um, made referrals of new stories. And in the part, and blue is, blue is Facebook, uh, red is Google. The obvious point is that, you know, over the last few years, Google, which is fundamentally search, you know, you Google something, you type in I want to find out about conservative policy on the floods. Um, you find out by searching for something specific. You choose what you're looking for. Um, Facebook is quite different. Obviously, Facebook is a social network. Your friends that you are connected to will share uh, information with you and stories with you. So it's much more about peer referral. Now, and you can see that peer referral is, is zooming upwards. Um, recently, The Guardian discovered that more people were finding its stories through social networks than were finding it through search, which when you start to think about it is really interesting. It's about, in a sense, other people, your peers, being your information providers, or at least being your editors directing you to certain kinds of information. One of the, the, one of the consequences, for example, is that um, when people share ref, uh, links and when they refer their peers to other information, they tend not to share ugly news. Now, if you think about it, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? If you've got a friend, you'd much rather share some uplifting story that's going to make them feel better. Because most of us, and I know LSE people are slightly different because you're here you want to find out things and you're very intelligent and critical and realistic. But I think it would even be true of LSE people that you would tend to want to make your friends feel good and a bit more affirmed and a bit happier about the world. 
And so people will tend, as I say, not to share ghastly stories about Syrian massacres. What they would share would be an uplifting story about a little boy in Syria who's managed to escape from Homs and has been reunited with his family, something like that. So it could be about the same subject. It might even be telling you a similar story, but in a different way. And as I say, you know, we don't know what kind of impact that's having on politics or news yet, but it, it's interesting how the filter bubble is not just about whether you're only talking to people who share your political beliefs, for example, but it's changing the very quality of the kind of interactions that you're having. Um, but of course, you know, all, all these um, trends have to come with media history health warnings. And I think this image shows you beautifully how the idea that... Now, do we think that these people all stood up after 10 minutes and swapped their newspapers around? No, we don't. We know that they lived in their own pre-digital bubbles. Hence the expression, which I think in a way we use less now, actually, he is a sun reader. She is a typical telegraph reader, and she is a guardian Easter. You know, you would describe people's politics and social attitudes according to which newspaper they read. Um, I, I suspect that's diluting somewhat. But, you know, the idea that people haven't always filtered themselves is not true. The important thing, I think, is that they do it in different ways. Another interesting one, which is kind of related, I suppose, which is... Um, the, uh, the idea of um, fragmentation, uh, which is kind of the, uh, um, what's his name, Putnam, um, the book Bowling Alone, the idea that society is becoming more individualised, atomised, less socialised, less cohesive. Um, well, again, the research is, is, is complicated, but um, Keith Hampton, for example, I think he's at Pennsylvania now, he did that, I love this, little bit of work, he'd been doing it for decades on how people interact in public spaces and then he adapted it to the rise of the mobile phone to see whether people, whether having, being more wired if you like, having a mobile phone for example, meant that you were less likely to interact with other people and I don't know if it's surprising or not but he found that actually more wired people, people who use mobile phones more, were actually more connected and if you think about it, that's not so surprising. People use their phones to say, would you like to come for lunch? Um, and if they're talking to somebody on their phone, then they are being social and connected. But they were being, and he shows the evidence, that they were being more sociable, even in a public space. And so again, you know, um, the media may not, have been, may not be the critical factor. There's a whole series of social and economic pressures, education, for example, that perhaps drivers to be more individualistic. Um, but the idea that it's, it's the internet or the digital uh, is very much unproven. Uh, another one is distraction, the idea that the internet is kind of making us stupid, we can't pay attention, we're too easily distracted. But again, something else is going on here that isn't just about the tech or isn't just about the digital tech. That, you know, when we look at uh, over time, in 1968, Nixon would get an average 43 seconds. By 1988, uh, Mondale, etc., were only getting nine seconds. But even before that, I think it's interesting, the newspaper, you know, the average newspaper quote, this is American, of course, in uh, 1892, um, the average quote was 1.7 column inches, which is a lot of words. And even by 1916, you know, this is, you barely got radio by now, haven't you? Um, so you, you're completely um, wood pulp based. Um, it's, it's already dropping. Now, if you're a politician, your instant, you know, this is, strikes fear into your, to your heart. But um, apart from the fact that it shows that there's a historical context, I think it also makes you think, well, uh, is this actually such a bad thing? If you, have, has anybody read, you know, reports of Gladstone's speeches in the Times in the, in the, you know, in the 1800s? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm told he was a great orator, but I imagine reading that stuff is incredibly boring and dull um, and undemocratic in the sense that any people who could afford to do it were probably aristocrats who were sitting on their arse all day and therefore could afford to read that kind of speech. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily about attention spans declining. Uh, it could be a wonderful thing, which is that politicians are getting better 
uh, at expressing themselves more pithily and in a more engaging way. And one of the nice things about digital is that you can actually uh, measure this process much more precisely. Again, don't worry about the detail on this. This is something called Medium, which is a kind of um, a publishing platform, blogging platform, a relatively serious, um, and very various articles. And this just shows you what happens to people's attention. Nothing terribly surprising. It declines. It scatters. Some very noble people left, reading lots and long. Uh, but generally speaking, their particular optimum was seven minutes. And the point about this is that it allows you to think with real empirical data about how, if you need to, how you might get that graph to tilt upwards by changing the way you write, for example. Or it may be that you just face reality and say, right, we've got to make sure that we get all we want to get across in that seven minutes. And so digital allows you to truly understand uh, the reality of, of, of attention and engagement with, with the readers. It's extraordinary the information they have now. The Guardian, like all newspapers, has, has a, and if you, if you ever meet a Guardian journalist, ask him to show you his, oh God, what's it called? It's got some Latin name anyway. It's a software, and he or she can look at their website and see what the traffic is happening around a story they might have just written. So they can tell if they tweet it, does attention go up? When they publish it at a certain time of day, does it get more attention? They can tell who's looking at it. You know, if people are retweeting it, they can see who's retweeted it, for example. And of course, the, guardian, the, journal, the journalists generally hate that kind of stuff because you, you, unprovably you can say, your article is getting 20,000 readers, yours is only getting 1,000. Now, if that's all you care about, then that's a bit sad because the 1,000 readers might be staying for longer, for example. They might be more loyal readers overall. If you go chasing the easy hits, you may actually end up with less engagement eventually and more competition with the male. So it doesn't tell you everything, but it tells you a lot about the realities of engagement. And I'm going to come back to that at, at the end if we get time. Um, so, much more complicated and interesting, but here's the, um, the political bit, which, if you don't mind, I'll tell you just quickly, because it's fun to see it and you deserve a break from me. Um, but I'm going to tell the story of Nick Clegg's sorry. Is everyone familiar with Nick Clegg? More familiar than you want to be, probably. But um, Nick Clegg, Deputy Prime Minister, lied to the British public before the last election. He didn't want to um, restrict student tuition fees. He didn't want to um, reduce them, but he, uh, and he's admitted as such. He, he did want to increase them, and he lied to the British public. In fact, he signed a pledge saying he wouldn't do it, even when he actually personally felt the opposite. And so he had the grace however many years into it was, what date is this, 2012, two years after the election, to say to the British public, sorry. Now, let's just play this, because it's worth, I sound like I've got a grudge against him, but. To take this opportunity to put a few things straight. When I meet people around the country, it's obvious that many of you have strong and pretty mixed reactions to some of the things that Liberal Democrats have done in government. Many of you tell me that you're glad that at a time of real economic uncertainty, we put aside our political differences to provide our country with stable leadership. But I also meet people who are disappointed and angry that we couldn't keep all our promises, above all our promise not to raise tuition fees. And to those people, I say this. We made a promise before the election that we would vote against any rise in fees under any circumstances. But that was a mistake. It was a pledge made with the best of intentions, but we shouldn't have made a promise we weren't absolutely sure we could deliver. I shouldn't have committed to a policy that was so expensive when there was no money around, not least when the most likely way we'd end up in government was in coalition with Labour or the Conservatives, who were both committed to put fees up. I know that we fought to get the best policy we could in those circumstances, but I also realise that isn't the point. There's no easy way to say this. We made a pledge, we didn't stick to it, and for that I'm sorry. 1 minute 27 in to the video. The video, which you know, is sort of 
smarter version of the Gordon Brown one, really, isn't it? But it, one minute um, 27 in, he finally says those, those, those critical words. Now, this was a reaction from, um, if you like, a, a, a concerned citizen. How many people saw that video? Well, 120,000. Okay. Next version. I'd like to take this opportunity to put a few things straight. When I meet people around the country, it's obvious that many of you have strong and pretty mixed reactions to some of the things that Liberal Democrats have done in government. Many of you tell me that you're glad that at a time of real economic uncertainty, you put aside our political differences to provide our country with stable leadership. But I've also met people who are disappointed and are angry that we couldn't keep all our promises. We couldn't keep all our promises above all our promise not to raise tuition fees. And to those people, I say this. We made a promise before the election that we would vote against any rising fees. We would vote against any rising fees. We would vote against any rising fees. It was a pledge made with the best of intentions. The best of intentions. We shouldn't have made a promise. We weren't absolutely sure we could deliver. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, because that's going to stick in your heads for days now. Yeah, yeah. See, how many people have read, watched that? Two million. How does he react? <coughs> On mainstream, this is mainstream item, top political program, the next day. How does mainstream media's finest respond? Okay. He was contacted by the people who made the video and he said, yeah, of course you can put the video out, of course you can. Just give all the money to my favourite charity in my constituency in Sheffield, that would be fine. As you see, he's laughing. Um, and so where does the story go? Um, this becomes the sort of definitive... This is sorry, a selection Yesterday, of the. Yesterday, we told response. you how the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg issued a public apology for breaking the Liberal Democrats' election pledge to oppose any increase in university tuition fees. Well, today it's been set to music. Sorry, I'm so, 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 sorry. Let's take a look at the weather now. Peter Gibbs is here. Follow that, Peter. I'm not going to sing it before you. <laughs> oh, that's a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. You're dead right. And why Nick Clegg's apology on. So, can you hear what's happened there? The piece of satire has suddenly turned into. Because he responded in a, in a, in a I thought, a very good way. He laughed, he joked, he didn't try to obstruct it. He was very human about it. The, only, the one bit, when you remember that story, what do you remember from that bloody story now? What is stuck in your heads now? Yeah, which bit of them? Which bit? The apology. The apology. No, sorry, 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 you sorry. You forget about the tuition fees, the, Exactly. Right? Well, you forget about tuition fees, certainly. That's a good point. You forget about the tuition fees. You forget about the content. You just remember Nick Clegg being associated with something funny and he said sorry. And yet we've seen that video. I played you 1 minute 30 where he struggled painfully to get to what wasn't even a sorry. He said we were sorry that we weren't entirely clear before the election that we might have changed our mind because the government had to change and we had to keep the country. See, that's not a sorry. And yet the narrative emerging from this is, strangely enough, because he handled it well, partly, um, but strangely, is absolutely gold dust, I think, PR gold dust for the Lib Dems. Now, you can talk about that, whether it's, you know, whether they intended that or not. They did not intend it, I'm sure. Um, but it's interesting that um, the so-called uh, 
critical uh, accountability effect of social media in this case has turned into a situation where it's in been incredibly amenable to what that mainstream politician uh, wanted to achieve. And I think it's sort of a nice thing because, you know, we now do think of it as a real apology, although, as you said, we've forgotten even what the, what the hell he was apologising for because of the funny song. Um, so I'm, all I'm saying then, it's a kind of joke example, and I think the jokes are really important, by the way. The next book, I think, will be about humour in politics and social media because uh, I think that's been transformative, the way that humour is used against politicians and how they can use use it to their own advantage or to deal with it and it reflects on people's scepticism and perhaps their reluctance to engage with the details of policy uh, uh, and so the the rhetoric now is more likely to come through a an auto-tune parody on on youtube than it is from some sort of gladstonian um oration so um i want to leave sort of time for questions and so on so um, as I head towards the end, I'm going to be slightly briefer. But it's to point out that, yeah, not everyone takes to YouTube to do funny videos. Uh, that it's undeniable that um, digital has allowed people not just to critique politicians and politics, but to create their own political movements. Um, so this one is um, UK Uncut, which is the student. Um, <coughs> Uh, activist group, uh, again, fighting against tuition fees, strangely. Um, but also, do you all f familiar with um, a colleague here at the LSE, Caroline Criado Perez, who represents the positive aspect of campaigning online? She campaigned to get a woman's face on the banknotes, the Jane Austen. She campaigned to get that on. Uh, the downside was that, from what apparently was a sort of relatively innocent. Um, political campaign, she then became subjected to the most appalling and when I say appalling I really mean ugly, bullying, threatening, offensive abuse uh, through social media as she tried to uh, translate that campaign into something slightly more broad around feminism and so on. Um, so again these, these campaigns I think, especially when you think of others like Coney 2012, and I've left some copies of a report that I did which is partly about the Coney 2012 um, campaign. Uh, when you think of uh, that campaign, which was, I don't know if you're familiar with it, got tens, in fact it got 100 million uh, views on uh, YouTube for a video campaigning to get um, Lord's Resistance Army um, leader Joseph Coney arrested by sort of international police. Uh, most successful political campaigning video of all time by a million miles. Where is Joseph Coney now? Well, 2012 is long gone and he's still out there, of course, being a very nasty chap. Um, likewise with Facebook, you know, obviously it had a catalytic role, social media had a catalytic role uh, in the Arab uh, uprisings, but of course we're very much conscious that broader media, Al Jazeera, newspapers, had a bit, perhaps had a bigger impact in terms of media, and also, of course, social forces like unemployment, the education of young people, and so on, the demographics of that region were what really drove those changes. And even in our own lovely London riots, again, the LSE link being a criminology department working with The Guardian on, on a research project around that, which showed that, um, well, amongst other things, uh, showed that uh, young people were using BlackBerry Messenger especially um, to coordinate their destructive activities, even whilst at the same time journalists were using social media to report on it. Uh, and the cleverer police indeed were also using social media to try and um, police it as well. So, you know, we can recognise that um, this kind of online campaign, this kind of direct politics, um, you know, is quite extraordinary. Um, it does enable people like these three to be independently very powerful, independent both of conventional politics and uh, conventional journalism in some ways, although all are indeed networked into mainstream politics. Ju Julian Assange famously, of course, with WikiLeaks, um, but then working most effectively when he was uh, collaborating with people like the New York Times. 
and The Guardian, um, Syrian freedom fighters. At a time when no one, no mainstream journalist could report on the war in Syria, they were producing huge volumes of material for YouTube, uh, which wasn't just going onto social networks, but was also then being used by uh, mainstream media organisations. Uh, and funny enough, one of my favourites is this woman, Martha Payne. Do you, know, do you know about the school dinners blogger? Anybody? She was, uh, she's from Scotland, and she had a blog about school dinners, which sometimes was rude about the school dinners, and Argyle and Butte Council, whatever it was, banned her, stopped her. And of course, when you, blap, when you ban a blogger, what happens? There's a Twitter storm, and by the end of that day, they had to allow her to start blogging again. And what was nice about it, um, she had a very media savvy father, it has to be said. Um, but what's nice about it, she then used her renown, her fame that she got, to fundraise for a charity that provides um, school dinners, funnily enough, for um, teenagers in Africa, school children in Africa. So she was able to use that in quite a nice positive way. Now, she is not the most powerful person in the world, a lot less powerful than the other two people. But she's more powerful um, because she's a teenage girl and we don't really know what she's going to do. Or people like her, her generation, we, we just don't know really what they're going to be doing in terms of their relationship with politics and the media. In many ways, if you talk to tech people, she is the most frightening person in the world because it's incredibly difficult uh, to predict the kind of behaviours um, and the kind of um, platforms, etc., that she might or people like her are going to be using over the next 10 years. So, it's a challenge to the journalists, it's also a challenge to the politicians because, however imperfect some of those um, campaigning um, political, independent, digital uh, platforms are, um, there's definitely a real sense. Uh, that politicians are operating uh, in an environment of greater transparency. Um, there is still a culture, especially in this country, of secrecy. Um, people still understand that information is power. Um, but how they manage that relationship, how politicians or uh, the executive manage that, is much more subject to forces that they are less able to control. Now that isn't some kind of wholesale shift in power, uh, but I would argue it's definitely uh, a different uh, relationship. Uh, and in that sense, um, uh, the, the point about uh, Gordon's Brown's video was not that it was a, a stylistic mistake, although it was, but for me it was because he didn't understand what you do when you're in that glass box. He didn't understand the new etiquette, literally, how do you talk to people in this, these networks, but also the new ethics, which is that if you want to be listened to, then you should really start with doing a bit of listening yourself. Um, and that it is, a new, it is a relationship with the citizen that isn't just based on uh, you pronouncing. Uh, and very much for journalists, I think it's a similar challenge. This is Emily Bell, used to be at The Guardian's now at Columbia. Um, she was talking about WikiLeaks there, but I think there's a broader point there, which is that uh, journalists have sort of forgotten about what their value is to the citizen in any kind of process, but especially a political process, and that journalists themselves need to sort of realign their work to make it more relevant to the, to the citizen. I mean, literally, because you desperately want their attention, otherwise you go bust, but also as a way of discovering the sort of public purpose uh, of journalism, especially political journalism. So, um, last couple of slides. As I keep trying to say, for me, the real crisis is not authority. It's not whether you trust journalists or politicians in this new environment, uh, but it's how do they retain people's attention, literally in the sense of getting them to click or listen to what you're writing or saying. Um, but more profoundly than that, that you have some value to them, that you're providing some kind of worth, that, that, that they literally have an interest in paying attention to what you as a politician or as a political journalist are, are saying. And I'm convinced that 
the, if you like, the ethical economy of this sort of networked environment is one where you will only get that trust if you are relatively transparent and relatively accountable. Uh, and then, you know, people will judge. Do you remember that graph when it's people judging by sharing your material on social networks? They will judge whether you're relevant, whether they want you to be proximate to, to, to themselves and their, their peer groups, to their communities. They will judge that by whether they share what you've got to say. So, um, how do you do that? Well, here's my nice example. Um, this, is, um, this is obviously a recent thing from BuzzFeed. Do people know what BuzzFeed is? BuzzFeed is a very, very simple idea, which is that people love lists. So it's, a, it's actually American-based originally. It's now very strong in Britain. And they publish lists about <coughs> things. And lots of people read them. Look at that, 600,000 on this one. Uh, Social lift. That's how often it's been retweeted and oh. shared and all that kind of stuff. Um, and BuzzFeed isn't created by the public. I mean, you can, sorry, you can create, you can go on here and create your own bits as well. But generally speaking, it's written by people. Jim Waterson is their recently appointed British political correspondent. So this is how Jim does the flood story. Um, the technique is you write one little paragraph, one line, and there has to be a photo with it. In this case, they're real photos of real events. The point is that, <laughs> that most of you are laughing at that. So you're much more likely to share that, aren't you? You know? Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't want to over-interpret. Um, BuzzFeed will do quite serious stuff. It will do um, 30, 30 executions of protesters in Kiev. Um, although 90% of it is, is um, humorous and, and usually around personal. If you go to the top, most of their stuff is, this is their, this is their, li their lists. You know, new entertainment is by far the most important life, whatever that is, um, <laughs> and that's how you rate it. That's how you rate it, which to those of us over 50, we don't even understand what that means. But that's how you rate it, and then that will mean it will move up <laughs> according to how many hits and how people have rated it. But the point about this is uh, that, first of all, that, that BuzzFeed are increasing, and it, and it is working. Is getting people to look at political stories that people who wouldn't normally, younger people, for example, uh, and I d again, I don't over in interpret this one, but they are, they are, um, what's the word? They are critiquing um, the sort of facile political nonsense that our politicians indulge in. Politicians expect to be taken seriously because they wander around some floods, uh, pointing, and they expect that to be seen somehow metaphorically as a policy response to what's going on. Um, and so anyway, they're gently being knowing and sceptical and teasing about this. However, not by being completely horrid. You know, BuzzFeed is, is, is not vicious. Um, they're not, strangely, particularly cynical. I mean, I, I think they're sort of gently, uh, they're gently satirical uh, rather than being, uh, you know, there's much, much harsher, nastier stuff being said about politicians out there. Uh, and as I say, it does get people to engage partly because of the humour bit, partly because of simply the list business, um, but because they're talking human. They're talking to you and they're showing you things. And if you go out to the coffee areas around here as I was waiting to come to this lecture, this is what real people are doing. I was watching some people on their laptops with friends sharing stuff. They were looking and saying, have you seen this? Have you seen that? And some of them were talking about serious things and others were talking about holidays. And they were having a real conversation interspersed with all this stuff. It was part of their social exchange. I don't think any of them were talking about politics, um, but that's how people talk. Certainly how people talk in a networked environment where this kind of stuff uh, is part of their, um, not just their vocabulary, um, but literally the, the sort of structures and mechanisms by which they can have uh, what we in the media department call discourse, what other people call talking to each other. So, I'm not suggesting BuzzFeed is some sort of panacea, but I think it's an interesting straw in the wind which shows you how people are finding ways to reconnect even around politics. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, now, some questions. Have you got a question? Um, the question was, will the fact that the, uh, correct me if I got this wrong, that uh, the editors and presumably therefore the advertisers who fund indirectly large amounts of the revenues of traditional media outlets, if they, if they are more and more interested in the number of times an article is shared and the number of hits it gets and comments it gets, will that distort what, it, what the editors and sub-editors then decide should be put out? I mean, I th from a journalist's point of view, that's probably the most important question, and it's the one that worries them the most. Um, it's always been that way. You know, journalists have always worried about, they've had to worry about newspaper sales, how many people watched the programmes I produced. And so you didn't know instantly how, what the numbers were, and you didn't know how it related to a particular story all the time, but you got a pretty good sense. So, for example, um, when I was at the BBC, we were always dread I, I worked during the period of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, and there was no story more guaranteed to drive the viewer away than that really important story about Northern Ireland. The only programme I worked where it didn't seem to have that effect was Channel 4 News, where you could put any kind of boring crap on and they'd watch because they were so serious and earnest people, uh, allegedly. Um, but, so that's always been the case. People have always worried about popularity, whether they're public service or commercial. The difference is now that, as you said, it's much more visible. So you've got the, that bit, and you go and look at the most read, it's always different to the, 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 the running order of a website. Um, and that's because those media organisations realise that if everyone chases the biggest traffic, it's a kind of zero-sum game. You can't all, uh, if everyone just did celebrity news, then that's all you'd be doing. And because everyone's doing it, the cake would be shared more evenly. Do you see my point? If everyone just talks about Justin Bieber all the time, at some point there are diminishing returns. And the, what I was trying to show with some of the information you can see um, from you know, the clicks on articles and so on is that you are now, the other effect of the internet means that I can now find the niche people who are interested, for example, in death destruction or economics around the world. If I just had a market in Britain, then, and let's take the Economist, they sell whatever it is, 20,000. But if the Economist can sell its articles around the world, then the 2% of people interested in, in that niche in every country can access the Economist stuff. So it's actually better, it's, it's a better time to be doing difficult minority type journalism if you can find those people. And a lot of this, um, information that you get on traffic tells you that kind of stuff, you know, where people are reading you and so on. So actually, clever journalism businesses talk about attention, they don't talk about traffic. And so, so generally speaking, I don't see much evidence of it. There are some, you know, I mean, the, the interesting one would be the mail, for example, which has become phenomenally successful online with a kind of celebrity-driven uh, diet, which is definitely, mail online is completely different to the mail newspaper. Go and compare the two. They're quite, quite different. Softer. What? The mail online is softer. It's less political, much less political, less for example, yeah. but it's still got exactly the same, inverted commas, ghastly ethics. Um, but it's got different content. So, but it's one of the rare examples. If you go and look at The Guardian online, or The Times online, or The BBC online, it's very similar to what they are in their traditional platforms, because that's their brand. And that will, in the end, be the thing that people will stick with, I think. So, no, I don't think sensationalism triumphs. Beyond sensationalism, though, what about non-sensational... There are, you know, you can see, in, in, if you look at the traffic on non-sensational, park Justin Bieber for a moment, and uh, what about an article saying why immigration is good for Britain? That would get you a lot of traffic. Yeah. Articles on immigration always get lots of traffic. So even within a sort of serious uh, subjects, some will get lots of traffic, whereas you know, stories about war-torn zones, which frankly have been war-torn for a very long time, and fatigue has set in, we'll get less traffic. Question, do you go for another story on immigration or 
Benefit Street itself, an interesting halfway house between a very serious story and a sensational story, you know, you must be sorely tempted, even within the serious part of journalism, to go for the stories that get you that much more traffic. Yeah, um, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, in, in some way, that, that's a good thing in the sense that um, there, you know, there's the whole argument that um, the political classes in Britain have, generally speaking, not wanted to talk about immigration. If you were pro-immigration for the last 20 years because of its economic virtues, you know, cosmopolitan virtues, you kept quiet about it because you didn't think it was a great vote winner. If you were anti-immigration, you kept quiet about it because you didn't want to sound like a fascist. You know, and it was you didn't want to, didn't want to be racist. So in many ways, we've just not had a conversation about immigration, and uh, we're now having a we are now having a conversation about immigration. I think quite a, you know, despite some of the crudities of it, a relatively sophisticated conversation about an incredibly difficult topic, um, which I feel very strongly differently to the Daily Mail, for example. But having been to Holland, where they ignored the issue of immigration and they ended up with a bunch of far right wing parties and liberal social democracy in ruins because the establishment kept quiet about it. So perhaps if they'd listened more to the traffic, if you like, and dealt with that rather than suppressing it. So I don't think it's always a bad thing to say, let's listen to what the viewers uh, or readers are interested in. Um, but yeah, certainly. And on, on foreign news, above all, has always been, unless people are killing each other in a spectacular way, it's always been deeply uninteresting. And that's for a very good reason that none of us live abroad. Right. You know, and I say that again as somebody who's passionately interested in the world, you know, cosmopolitan background. I spend a lot of time writing about that. You know, the thing there, the, 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 the report I've written there that I've left lying around is about how you do try and connect people to the world. But I think you have to be very careful not to assume that we all live in the LSE. Most people are, you know, living somewhere else. It's okay. called local. Right. You got yeah, I had a question. Then I'll, come, um, I'll come to you next. When, when you talk about like these new platforms like Reddit or Facebook, where you can share, where you can have genuine, genuine you know, political debate um, regarding current uh, current events, um, but most of them are are like drowned between, um, you know cute pictures of kittens or Jennifer Lawrence or things like that. Um, how, what do you see, how do you see this evolving in the future? Because if there's a decline in readership of newspaper, if you have less people getting their news through the, t the, the TV, um, do you see this new like information context as being an opportunity uh, with which to you know, deliver better info because you have a much, a lot more resources? Or do you see it as a risk of, you know, down the line, not even being able to do so because the information is so, you know, convoluted and so much nonsense that it's just you, you can never you can ne never verify the accuracy or you know the wealth. Of, of the yeah. Well, I think <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. There is a super abundance of information. Yes, you're absolutely right. There's people talk about a real sense of confusion. You know, a real sense of uh, and there's a the late Stanley Cohen of this parish um, wrote a fantastic um, piece about how people, if they know too much about something, especially something bad, like suffering somewhere else, they will actually push it away. You know, And how wonderful that we've got these distractions. So much easier to push away stuff, the bad stuff, and just concentrate on the fluff. There's so much fluff constantly saying, look at me, look at me, isn't there? So I'm agreeing with your your first kind of premise. Um, but strangely, all the evidence I see is that, firstly, people, human beings seem to be remarkably good at filtering out stuff, better than you think. They may not do it rationally. They may not be sitting down and saying, have I read 20% of foreign news coverage today? Have I read 30% of economic analysis? Um, but they are very good at filtering out what is relevant to them, what interests them. And I could tell a story, and BuzzFeed is part of that, actually, of extraordinary, and the other ones, UK Uncut, and the Caroline Criado Perez thing. Uh, I see all around me extraordinary amounts of people being active politically. I go on Mumsnet and see endless people chundering about what they wouldn't call politics, 
but very often is. There's often a better way of talking about political issues than I used to be able to do as a political journalist. So I see a sort of, I see a superabundance of stuff generally, but I see a superabundance of people talking, and it, let's use politics as the, as, the, as the benchmark here, about politics. So I don't see some effect where, you know, in, in Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, the kind of everyone's eating soma and just spaced out in a kind of blancmange veg. I see quite the opposite, and the immigration one's a great example. You know, people always say, I'm not political, but what Cameron said the other day, blah, 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 you know, you know, politicians, they're all bastards. And then they start to venture into a political discussion, which shows they must have listened to politicians at some, some point. Your other question, I think, is a really, really important one, um, and let's save another hour for that, which is, but the BuzzFeed one was an attempt to start talking about how do you get, pe give people the tools, and for me as a journalist, it's the most optimistic bit of the, the story, which is that who are you going to call when you're struggling to access information that you find credible or compelling? Well, I, it's inverted commas, a journalist. Now, that journalist might be the guy sitting next to you who's referred a really good article to you, or it might be somebody with a brand, Glenn Greenwald or the New York Times. But I think increasingly in a world of confusion and complexity, it's a great business proposition to say, do you know what? I know what I'm talking about. I know how to connect these things. And I know how to give you stuff that I think you're going to find interesting. And I guess the, uh, at some level, we all use certain websites which we come to know to trust. I mean, I think that's the other thing. And also just the ease of it. I mean, what's, it is a trade-off. The ease means, uh, uh, did I tell the story in the first lecture about how I used to have to go to the archive, the newspaper archive, the bits of paper, and now you're just one click away from doing the kind of research that used to take me days and weeks when I had to do it by analogue, ringing people up and ringing and looking through documents. You know, the, the ease is so extraordinary. And I realise that's a trade-off because you ease to get crap. That's why Gordon Brown's video is taken down. Yeah, that's right, you know. Yeah. Now, for the question at the back. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a clear question. And I, I'd, I'd like to add something to it. It's about the, it was covered slightly last week, but about the, the power of those <coughs> who currently control the media. But can I add to that, the question I was going to ask, which is how far can you see the new media as, as you were, anarchic challengers to the power elite that we would previously, and we've just heard, described as those who are, that would be true of all the media, existing media, left and right, all times. How much is this an anarchic challenge to them? Yeah. And uh, possibly a positive anarchic challenge to them? Yeah. I think it's a really good question. And, um, you know, could easily have spent a whole hour and a half just talking about that. Um, but it, it's very good that you've, re, re, you've raised that because it's very easy to get caught up in the sort of interesting technological changes and so on and think that, uh, and forget that there are other core facts. You know, and one of them is that the bulk of British journalism is um, owned by two people. One is Rupert Murdoch and the other one is Tony Hall who runs the BBC. It's quite interesting. If you count up this is really crude, okay, but there's about 15,000, say, journalists running around doing news. Uh, Murdoch owns about 5,000 of them. Tony Hall of the BBC owns 5,000. And the rest are the other newspaper titles and so on and commercial radio. So there's a real problem in Britain about a lack of plurality. Um, I actually like a lot of the stuff that Murdoch's people produce. I like a lot of the stuff that um, the BBC produces. But there's no doubt that even with all the lovely buzz feeds and all the other stuff, um, there is still a, a concentration of media ownership in relatively small hands. Much better, healthier than many other countries, but it's still, a, I think, a much more important issue than phone hacking, for example. I think phone hacking is pretty irrelevant, frankly, compared to that issue about power that you raise about who has the power. Uh, I think it can be exaggerated how much that transfers into real political power, but as we saw with the David Cameron, Rebecca Brooks thing, you know, there was a great collusion between the two, as well as an amount of conflict. I don't think, in answer to Tony's question, I don't think that new media 
is some kind of panacea. I don't think that mum's net is going to be more powerful than the Daily Mail. But I think we are seeing... Could it audit it, though? I mean, could it just sort it, of... Well, it, does, like it, private, audit, private it audits it like mad. Most, it seems to me that most of the social media is, spends its time critiquing the Daily Mail. All these people that hate the Daily Mail spend an enormous amount of time reading the bloody thing and saying how disgusted they are by the Daily Mail. Because it's very well put together. Because uh, it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant organisation. And it does real, real journalism. It does a lot of the things I'm talking about, creating real value, trying incredibly hard to be relevant to its readership and so on. So the Daily Mail is fantastic um, in the terms I'm talking about. Um, but I, I think new media, the other bits, the new bits that are springing up, do provide an alternative of sorts. They are reconditioning where you may get sources of information and how you think about them. So if you are on Twitter, God help you, but you know I am. You know, if you're on Twitter, you will have a sort of almost personal, a uh, permanent. Um, it's like a kind of um, what's the word? Tweak in your eye, sort of glitch, mm. where whenever you see something, you think, yeah, what would Twitter think? You know. What will my cynical friends on Twitter say about this? Um, so you, there's always that extra conditionality around your consumption of media now because of a relative plurality. But the idea, your point, the idea that the sort of fundamental gravity of where the power lies certainly uh, hasn't shifted. It makes it much harder for people to control, including Murdoch or Paul Dacre, partly because they're struggling economically. You know, and they're struggling literally. Their, their readership is, is is continuing to decline. Um, but you're absolutely right that the gravity of power still lies in the bowels of mainstream media. It's just coming up to it has actually passed six. So just to ask one final question, Charlie. I mean, is it too early for there to be any, as it were, academic um, sort of quantitative? research evidence about the impact of this radical change in the way the media now works on the way people think or even vote. I mean, are we that, is it too early for that to have been, you know, we, have, we, we kind of know that, uh, that, you know, if you read The Sun, you, you, you might well vote Labour, and if you read The Daily Mail, you might well vote Labour, and if you read... Uh, the Guardian, you might well vote Conservative. We know that, but that in the end, from when you said that last week. But what about the impact of this change on voting behaviour and indeed political thinking? Do we have, is it too early yet? Yeah, as, as far as I can see, most, most of the evidence is. Um, I, mean, I read a brilliant bit of research today which said that if you win the lottery, or even just 500 quid on the lottery, if you win 500 quid on the lottery, you are very statistically significantly likely, more likely to switch your vote from left to right. Okay? <laughs> That's real impact. For 300 quid, you're prepared to dump Ed Miliband and vote for David Cameron. Now that's real measurable impact. Um, it's much <coughs> harder to say, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the internet and digital, all these things I'm talking about, are not left or right. We've seen uh, when the Tories were out of office, the right, the blogosphere was, the right-wing blogosphere was brilliant. Um, Conservative home. Kind of that's thing. right. And sadly, the left-wing blogosphere has not responded so well, but we've seen other things like UK Uncut and so on arise. So I don't think it's ideological. I don't think there's going to be that kind of effect because, despite what Noam Chomsky says, I don't think media has that ability to um, dictate uh, above it may at the margins and its condition and its environmental, but it doesn't have the driving impact that social economic changes would have, like gender, like women going to work, women ha getting economic income, so they choose which media you consume in the house, for example, and which gadgets you buy. Um, so I don't want to denigrate my own, you know, my own subject area, which of course is terribly important, uh, the catalyst. But I think you know it's similar to politicians. Journalists are kind of negotiating. They're like in a canoe going down a fast-flowing river through some rapids, and you can steer one way or the other. But the, the general direction of travel is dictated by something much stronger than, than than media itself. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Charlie. <laughs>